Open your Bibles. I'll be there in a few moments. The book of Matthew. Gospel of Matthew. Matthew 16. I'll be there in a few moments. Now, I've been preaching. I think this is either the third or fourth message of the Mark of the Beast. And I'll be going back to that in a few moments. And I've been camping out on the cross. Showing you different pictures, reading you different sources of information, the history of it. And I'll continue that tonight and next teaching program also on this subject. Before I come to go any further, I want to lay down enough foundation. Are you saying the mark is the cross? No, I'm not. I have never said that. I'll show you how and why. It's important to know that the cross is not Christian and how eventually that's going to be important to know when we get to the mark. Because that will be brought up again when once we get there. It's not the mark, but there is a connection. Just have some patience. I'll be there in a few short messages. I have to lay down more foundation. Before I go any further tonight, though, I want to read you something. This is cross-related. The way the Christian world thinks about the cross. And yes, this Mark of the Beast series of messages in the last day series is going to turn the world upside down and it's going to upset many of the Christian world if, if not most because it's different. You see crosses all over the place. People wearing jewelry from their, ear, from their ears around their necks, necklaces, ankle, ankle braces or bracelets or whatever you call it rings, headbands, on church steeples, crosses you hang up on the wall, and they don't even have a clue the background history on that particular cross that's become so popular to use starting 1700 years ago with Constantine. That's not, no, Constantine didn't start the use of the cross. He just made it popular. It actually started before that. New Testament, early church. Never recognized the cross as we know the cross today as a religious relic. That's something man created as some type of icon or relic to be adopted into their belief systems, thinking that would give them some type of protection from evil. In a sense, without saying too much, they were correct if they knew how to apply it, which cannot be applied any longer. since Christ's time. But they don't even got that down right. It's a mute point. But I read this article yesterday, and I said to myself, now this is a teenage kid from Fort Worth, Texas. Good intentions, probably a fine young man, but misguided and misled. 
Cross-bearing Texas teen arrives in D.C. after a month-long journey. The Oasis Church is in Saginaw, north of Fort Worth, Worth, Texas. But early Friday, the congregation gathered and waited anxiously in the pews to finish a journey 1,400 miles away. Quote, our country's in a serious moral decay, end of quote. The pastor, now this is the pastor, told the congregation over the PA system as they waited, quote, and that is what this journey is about, end of quote. As the pastor paced back and forth delivering his message, images began flickering on a large projection screen behind him. The picture was shaky as the photographer moved the computer's camera into position. But between the blurs of trees and sky, there were glimpses of the White House, the White House in Washington, D.C. The church had gathered to watch 19-year-old, I won't give you the name, finish a cross-bearing pilgrimage to Washington, D.C. The congregation of Oasis watched over the Internet. Finally, there was the face of this teenager on the screen as he leaned against a 12-foot-long cross. They made a 12-foot-long cross with a little wheel at the end of the, the long stem part of the cross. And he dragged that. Like that individual, I can't remember his name now, that done it for decades. Carried this long cross. I took up my cross and I carried it around the world to get the message of the gospel out there. You think if that was really an effective piece of, or effective tool to get the gospel out, that the disciples would have came up with it. Or better yet, be instructed by Jesus Christ to go make yourself a cross, a Tammuz looking cross, if you've been hearing what I've been preaching about in the previous messages, and drag that along from place to place. Let's use props, which is the fad now in the Christian world, in the pulpits. Let's use a prop. For, forget this. They won't stop and just listen. Let's use props to get their attention. Listen, I came from a ministry which I didn't agree with. Well, I, they did certain things to get viewers to stop that normally wouldn't stop to watch. God's Word doesn't need any additional help if it's preached correctly. The Holy Spirit will go to work To make that connection. We don't need props. We don't need 12 foot crosses. We don't need a 2 foot cross. We have the rightly divided word hopefully being preached. If not, then listen to someone that does it. If you can't identify with this mission, you should try to find one. Please. Finally, there was the face of this teenager on the screen as he leaned against a 12-foot-long cross. Quote, I can't wait to get back home to all of you at the Oasis Church. End the quote. He told the congregation via the Internet. Quote, and I just wanted to share this with you. End the quote. He, this teenager, began his journey in early June in Fort Worth. He has carried his cross. He has carried his cross. Oh, that's popular to say. I carried my cross. I had taken up my cross. He has carried his cross along highways and back roads almost every day since. And like I said, why well, are you being hard on this teenager? Well, this teenager is a young man now at 19 years old. Unfortunately, he's not guided by a pastor that knows dilly squat about God's word. God's not looking for gimmicks to get people's attention. He could create gimmicks far better than man ever could come up with.
He began his journey in early June in Fort Worth. He, is, he has carried his cross along highways and back roads almost every day since. Quote, I felt God put this in my heart, and it's something I felt so strong about to just pick up my cross and carry it. Sorry, my friend. God did not put it on your heart, and your pastor should have been there to let you know that. Unfortunately, he's a spiritual fool also. And if that offends some, good. You make my Jesus look ridiculous. And it's not going to happen on my watch without me saying something. I felt God put this in my heart, and it's something I felt so strong about to just pick up my cross and carry it. End of quote. Two small wheels on the bottom of the cross allowed this teenager to carry his burden on his shoulders, to carry his burden on his shoulders along the shoulder of the, ro along the, shoulder of the roads during the journey. Quote, I think it's awesome, said o Oasis church member. It's not for attention to himself. What do you think is going to happen? What a naive statement. It's not for attention for himself. What he's wanting is to bring this country back to the founding principles formed on which is the cross of Jesus Christ. I'm sorry. This country was not founded on the cross of Jesus Christ. I don't know what history books you're reading, but I don't even know what Christian history books you're reading to get that kind of information. And that was his whole motivation for the whole thing. Quote, I'm speechless right now, standing here in front of the White House, end of quote. That's because you're probably out of breath. That was a long trip. He told a television photographer in Washington, quote, I'm amazed that he gave me the strength to make it. Good thing you're young. Well, you're mocking this. You're darn right I am. And this nation's attention will be brought back to the cross and brought back to Jesus Christ, and we will be one nation under God again. No, it won't. Not that way. His message brought a cheer from the small crowd gathered to welcome him to the nation's capital, and the congregation watching in North Texas cheered, prayed and sang along with the crowd in D.C. more than a thousand miles away. Quote, it's just overwhelming, said the church member. It's over, over, overwhelming what he's doing. Oh, he might be emotionally wrapped up in, in the fact that he carried this cross 1,400 miles and he actually made it. But that didn't do one darn thing for the cause of Christ. I'm sorry. Like I said, I don't take anything away from this teenager. I think he's a good person, more than likely fine young man, just misled and misguided. And unfortunately, you have too many pastors, too many preachers that are goofball for Jesus, and I clean that up, that you know better, that you know better with God's word, even in the minor sense. And with that, let's go to Matthew 16. Now, since I've been laying the groundwork on the cross and how eventually we're going to see how it's related in some way or fashion to the mark, aha, I just spilled some beans. Well, guess what? Stay tuned because there's a lot more to fill in before I get to that point. And I'm saying the cross is not the mark. So I have to sort all this out, don't I? Matthew 16 Of course, you read Matthew 16, starting with the 13th verse, which we've covered before. And then Jesus, we'll just pick it up at verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be, and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee. Actually, what he said is, Pity thyself. 
Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. He knew who was influencing Peter to be a mouthpiece of mouthpiece for Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. See, things that be of men create this idea that you need to create props, crosses to get people's attention. Man-made devices. They might be good-intentioned in the long run. But Christ doesn't need it. He made it very clear to his disciples, this is what's going to happen. Peter wanted Christ to reject those thoughts and definitely don't follow through on the thought to the point where Jesus would lose his life. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You desire or savor the things of this world. Not the things of God, but those that be of men. Then Jesus said to the disciples, basically was thinking, don't think like a man would think. Don't think about how you're going to, now, this is not his initial intention at this moment, but I'm talking about this teenager right now. You're thinking like a man. And what man does to try to get people's attention to listen to God's word, talk correctly. If you're a mouthpiece that preaches God's word, a chosen one to preach, it, to preach God's word, just keep on preaching. God will put you in the right places for people to hear the message, talk correctly, whether they're Christians already or new, Christ or new potential Christians that he's trying to draw into his family of believers. Now, Satan doesn't want that to happen. And it'll come with all kinds of tricks. Now, it was clear what Satan was trying to do with Peter, trying to get Peter to be a mouthpiece to discourage Jesus from doing that. But Jesus would have no part of it. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Of course, this is what you hear over and over have you taken up your cross yet? And of course, people mostly relate this to the burdens of your life, which has nothing to do with that. And I've mentioned this before. I'm not really changing what I've said before. I'm just now adding additional stuff to make it quite clear to you. Because I've had questions. What does his likeness mean? What is taking up the cross? If it's not for my own particular afflictions and burdens, oh, I'm carrying my burden, I'm carrying my cross, then what is it? And this is what's a travesty. That the message what is being relayed here, especially when you break it down in the Greek, is being lost. It is not taught correctly. So you get these silly ideas that, oh, I know. I'll build a 12-foot cross and show people that I'm taking up my cross I'm bearing my cross and I'm going across the country or across the world. Or whatever silly the other stupid device you make to try to get the message out. And show the world and show Christ that, hey, look at me. I don't do it to bring attention to myself, but that's exactly what's happening. And Satan's laughing all the way. Because even he knows how silly it is. You're carrying the cross of Tammuz. An idea that Samarimus and probably Nimrod received from Cush, who received the information from Ham, which 
Ham lived before the flood, a practice that started way back before the flood, and for a reason, which I'll get to still, which I haven't yet. Silly fool. This is not what Jesus is referring to. Go to the board. Now, I wrote it. I was, at first, I was going to write the transliterated Greek words to make it easier for you to read, but then I said, you know, I don't want to focus on the Greek itself. I want to focus on the yellow portions right below the Greek. This is not the transliterated Greek, by the way, but the, right below the Greek. I want to translate this for you. Let's read it one more time in the King James. Then Jesus said to his disciples, and this is where we'll start, If any will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, it's going to sound like broken English here, but this is how you would read it if you break it word, word for word down from the Greek. Then, the, the Jesus, or Jehovah is salvation, commanded the disciples. What did Jesus do? What did Jehovah is salvation do? He commanded. Not really an option, folks. It's not take it or leave it. If you're going to be a disciple, you're going to have to follow his command. Period. Then, the Jesus or the Jehovah is salvation commanded the disciples themselves. If certain desire, if certain desire afterwards of me to follow, afterwards of what we're going to follow that pertains to you, Jesus. Get it? Themselves a certain desire afterwards of me to follow, deny. Well, not really deny, but I wrote deny there anyway, because that's what it says in the King James Version. Forget oneself, forget oneself, oneself, and interests. Forget oneself and interests. Wow. Then the Jesus commanded the disciples themselves a certain desire afterwards of me to follow. So after something, after, well, you're going to say it after he said this. Well, after what else? And that's what we're going to get to. Forget oneself and interest. Themselves and take upon oneself and carry what has been raised up. That's where we get in the King James Version, other version, take up his cross. That's not what it's saying. Forget one's self and interests, themselves and take. In other words, this go in hand in hand with Luke 14. Maybe I'll get there here after I do this. Luke 14. Remember the Luke 14 it says, if you not hate father and mother and all that? And I've told you it's not really saying you have to hate your relatives. It's the, the Greek is very clear. You can't put them first. Christ is the centerpiece. He's first and foremost. Your interests has to be put in its priority level. And it's not first. Jesus first and all your interests follows. And if they fit in into what Jesus has planned for you, great. If they don't, you got to lose it. Or put on a shelf. Maybe he'll make it available for you at one time in the future or another. Afterwards, of me to follow, deny, or not deny, forget oneself and interest themselves and take upon oneself and carry what has been raised up. And this is where the translation is lost, folks. These next two, these three Greek words. Let me go to the board. Right here. To right here. This is where the translation is lost. <clears throat> Take upon oneself and carry what has been raised up. So basically, what this verse is saying, then the Jesus, this Jehovah's salvation, commanded the disciples themselves a certain desire afterwards of me to follow, which... You can't be a disciple of his if you don't have that desire to start with. Forget oneself and interests. Themselves and do what? Take upon oneself and carry what has been raised up. 
this cross. Bad translation, staru, for cross. It never meant what we think of cross today. It was a wood, a stake, an upright pale, used over and over in classical Greek literature, you find stake and upright pale being referred to over and over for starus, not cross as we identify what a cross is today. No. Take upon oneself and carry what has been raised up. If we were going to put this in some type of understanding of without broken English, we would say from this stake. Take upon oneself and carry what has been raised up from this stake or upright pail. Well, what, what did get raised up from that stake or upright pail? What? What? Christ. Christ was raised from the dead. That upright pail or stake did not obtain the victory. Satan thought he had it for a few days, but Christ rose from the dead. You don't believe Christ rose from the dead, then there is no victory over eternal death. I mean, eternal death, yeah, that's right. The grave does have its sting, but the grave doesn't because he did rise again. He did rise again. To follow, forget oneself, oneself and interests themselves, and take upon oneself and carry what has been raised, really, from this stake. He's telling his disciples, take up yourself and carry what has been raised up. Carry what? The gospel. Tell the story. Now, I put himself here, but it really is the same also follow. The same also follow or join as a disciple me. This is a command, folks, that if you have the desire to be a disciple, if you don't, you're not one, by the way. If you know that Jehovah is salvation because Jesus did die and raise again from the dead, then you are commanded as a disciple that has the desire afterwards of me to follow, after what this event that happened, after this was given as a set of instructions to disciples would take place, guess what? You're going to have to give up your, yourself and your interests. In the capacity that God's called you in to be his disciple. Not all of you are going to be preachers. Not all of you are going to be uh, pastors. Most are not. But whatever God called you in his kingdom to do what he wants you to be part of, guess what? A part of your life you have to give up, whether you like it or not. You're not exempt from it. He commanded what was going to happen. And we all have to take up one self and carry what has been raised up from this stake the same also a disciple the one that follows christ and joins as a follower of jesus christ and participates in what he commanded now come back to me now, where did my Bible go? I put it somewhere. Here it is. This is a command that once Christ be raised up from the dead, raised up from that stake that Satan thought he had the victory over, that pole, which three days later we found out that Satan didn't have the last word, did he? Guess what? I want you to be my disciple. Join me and carry what has been raised up. In other words, carry the gospel message, because guess what, folks? This is Jesus talking now. I'm alive. I'm alive, and they would carry the message forth that he's alive. 
What was prophesied came to pass. And now we have a New Testament, a new message, a gospel message of grace and peace and forgiveness because the unblemished lamb stepped in for us and he only had to do it once for our benefit. It's a command, folks. This is not a command to build crosses and plot around the world, around the country, to try to have people draw, I mean, have, have, try to have people draw to your feet, whatever it is. Wow, that's amazing. He's committed to doing something like that. You think that's going to really, really make a disciple? The instruction is with this message in another passage, go make disciples. What are you going to do? Recruit a bunch of carpenters to build crosses? So you all could go toting around the country with crosses behind your back? What are you going to call yourselves? The cross gang for Jesus? Christianity has been made to look silly. And it always has started because of the pastors behind the pulpit have no business being there. And that's become more and more obvious because they have different genders in the Word of God. The instruction we're commanded to follow is if we desire to be a disciple, and if you have no desire to be one, you're not going to be one, my friend. Afterwards of me, so after whatever happens to Jesus, for, you're going to have to forget yourself and interests and take up oneself and carry what has been raised up, the message of the gospel, the good news from this cross, from that stake. Not a cross the way you recognize it to be a Tammuz cross now that you have been, you've been more instructed. And you're going to do the same as you join me. As I brought the gospel message and lived it out for your benefit, you're going to join me and do the same by getting it out there that I raised from the dead. I rose from the dead. I'm alive and well. And I'm coming back again. In the meantime, my blood covered your sins and trespasses. Go to Jesus. He can make you clean by his precious blood and set you on a journey that will change your life from now to whenever he comes back or, do you, or until you go meet him. It's always been the same message. It's been twisted by stupid silliness, crazy doctrines and interpretations. It's never changed. You go to Luke 14.27. Luke 14.27. And you read, in the King James, and whosoever do not, doeth not bear or take up his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Let me tell you, you can write this down quickly. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to have time to write, it on the, uh, to write it on the board, so just write this down because I have it written in my Bible here. Who's, whoever... I'm telling you how this verse should be translated. Whoever that take up with hands, take up with hands, that stake or this stake or upright pail or pole themselves or himself, you want to personalize it, and come or to follow behind me. Which, I'm going slow enough so you can write it down, be able with power and strength. Now, you're not going to get that power and strength because you carry your cross. 
or you carry your steak or pail, if that's what you want to do. If they're going to copy anything, they shouldn't be copying a Tammuz cross. They should just get a pole, get a 12-foot pole and carry it around with the wheel on the end. I don't recommend any of that. But if you want to be accurate, what God's Word says, they're doing that even wrong. Which you will be able with power and strength or to be capable, strong and powerful is another way of saying it, to be my disciple. In other words, whoever that take up with hands, that take up the cross, the same, different language here being used, but carries the same idea that something that you have to pick up and carry forward that was on an upright pail or stake yourself and follow behind me. So after the fact, what Christ did, it also says you'll have the power, the strength. He will make you able with power and strength to be his disciple to make sure what he's commanded back in Matthew 16 to be fulfilled by you as a willing, desiring servant and disciple of Jesus Christ. And I could go to another passage in Mark. In Mark and in, in Matthew are similar, very similar, hardly any difference. Luke is just a little bit differently different. Luke gives us additional information, the most important information we'll find in Luke. And of course, this is Luke 14. That once you are his disciple, because you desire to be one, and you understand what the command was after what happened to him, he wants you. He had to convince his disciples, the last chapter of the Gospel of John, he had to convince Peter and a few others not to go back to their occupation before they met Christ, fishermen. He says, I will make you fisher of men, not a fisherman catching fishes. I'll make you a fisher of men. Fisher of men. He had to, even after his death and resurrection, Convince Peter, being the one in the forefront in, John, in, the, in the John record, to forget his interests, forget his self-interests, and put Christ first. That message hasn't changed. It's not a popular one any longer, because everyone wants to put all their self-interests first. And put Christ second. Actually, it's their self-interest, which includes their family, their job, whatever, and then maybe somewhere third or fourth comes Christ, if he's that lucky. If he's that lucky. Well, Christ commanded something different. And it's not this silliness that you see preached about the cross and taking up the cross. Literally taken up oneself, take upon oneself and carry what has been raised up from this stake or pole. What has been raised up? There's only one thing that was raised up, and that was Christ. So, yes, we are to preach the full gospel, his death, but also. His victory, His resurrection. You want to be a disciple of His? He then goes on to say, Join me as a disciple. Join me. In the Luke reference, I was going to go there, but I think I'm going to go there. I've been there before. But it's worth going back one more time. Luke 14, 25. 
And there went great multitudes with him. And he turned and said unto them, If any come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, in the King James, the other translations clean that up a little bit, but in the King James, it's not like you have to hate your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, blah, 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 blah. No, that's not what it's saying. What it's saying for the word hate here is loving one's relatives less than the Lord. In other words, loving the Lord more than your relatives. You got it? The forsake it not part of this verse Thirty-three. So likewise, whoever he be, he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath cannot be my disciple. It is not referred to the abandonment of one responsibilities or belongings, but putting them in a proper priority. They come second or third, depending on whatever your priorities are. Christ is first, and there's no watering down of that. Most people that I talk to or I communicate with, that backslide somewhere along their journey is because of one reason and one reason only. Oh, they try to justify other reasons in there. It's because you put Christ second, third, or fourth, if that high. Once he slips into the number two position in your priority list, You've begun your backslidden track. Period. I'm sorry if that offends you. Well, my family's important to me. My job's important to me. If I don't have my job, I don't pay it. No one's saying not to be responsible to your job. Christ probably has you in that position for a reason. And probably that reason is to support your family, if you have one, your responsibilities, not necessarily all your desires, you create those things, but also for your responsibility and the capacity he's called you to participate in getting the rightly, the word, rightly divided word out there. And most of the time it's going to require financial commitment on your part, which means that you're probably going to have a job or some source of income. Don't complicate this. And of course, I already read to you how it should be translated, verse 27. And then he goes into counting the cost of building the tower or a king that will be able to make war. And then it goes on into verse 30, 34 after that. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its savor, if it becomes flat and strengthless, Wherewith shall he be seasoned? In other words, it's no use any longer. Salt is good. We need salty Christians. And the only way you can remain salty if you put Christ first. That is it, my friend. You will become tasteless. You will become flat. You will become strengthless. Let Christ slip from that number one position. Verse 35 makes it really clear. It is neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dunghill. But men cast it out. He that have ears to hear, let him hear. You think you're a salty Christian who's going to carry a cross behind you across the country? No. I have advice for this teenager boy. Find a ministry that can teach him correctly and put all his time and his financial commitment or whatever his desire that he thinks God is leading him to be part of a ministry to good use. And he's young enough. He's going to have to do some time under some leadership. Too many of these hotshot college kids come out thinking they're ready for the ministry without doing an internship or as the world would call it an apprentice somewhere under something. 
that something being a person or organization with authority that's rightly dividing the word of God. Sorry. You're not ready. And I haven't met one in my lifetime that was ready at that young of an age. That's not to say that you should lose your enthusiasm for it if you feel the calling for it. But if you're really called, you will understand that you have to be under some tutorship. And tutorship is not college, Bible college or seminary. That's where you'll go wrong and be led astray into the silly doctrines that's preached out there. Find a ministry or a church that can mentor you, that can develop you into a disciple, a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Go back to Matthew. I'm not even going to get to what I wanted to go, where I wanted to go with Constantine tonight on the Mark of the Beast. But this is part of the Mark of the Beast. And when I preach the next few messages, you'll look back and say, you know what, it's a good, it's a good thing that we're starting to get an understanding what this word starus is used so many times in Scripture, what it truly means, this word cross, and how twisted it's become in its usage. Back to Matthew 16. After Matthew 16, 24, it goes on to say, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. If you're not willing to take up yourself and carry what has been raised up, if you're not willing to take up upon, upon oneself and carry what has been raised up, that's Christ Jesus and the gospel message from that stake which he came off as a dead man and rose as a victorious son of God. Fulfilling everything that was required in the Old Testament for him to fulfill. If you're not willing to be a part of that because you want to save your life, you've got better plans for your life. I'm not saying not to follow through on some of the plans. Like I said, most everyone listening to me is never going to be a preacher or a pastor or anything like that. That doesn't mean you don't have some kind of responsibility of getting the command that Christ said that you be a part of fulfilled in your life. I have people listening tonight that have situations and crises and circumstances that come up or have came, uh, that come up on periodically and as soon as that happens everything they were participating in all of a sudden took the back seat. You know who you are. I may not know who you are, but you know who you are. You have to ask the question, this is how I was participating in the capacity that I was called to participate and for some reason because of everything that happens around me, I'm not doing it any longer. You didn't even reduce it to handle all your situations. You eliminated it. What's wrong with you? If you're a babe in Christ, I can see how you slipped into that mistake of putting these other things first. If you're a more mature Christian, what do you need? A spiritual two by four? Well, the answer is obvious. Yes. But get it together. And saying, you know what? Enough of the distractions. I'm going to get on the saddle again. And I'm going to do what Christ has called me to do at this point. And it'll help you. Believe me, I've been through it enough in my lifetime. He'll help you far beyond any measure that you can imagine 
while you're still dealing with all those other distractions and circumstances. He'll help you. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profit? All the hustle and bustle of life. All the things that you're involved in of life. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? For what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward, reward every man according to his works. No, the Greek there is praxis. To his vocation or office. What Christ has called you to be part of. Period. When he comes back, Listen to me carefully. You recent saltless pretending Christians. When he's coming back, is he going to be able to reward you according to your vocation or office? In other words, what you've been participating in. What is going to be your excuse? Well, I was intending to do this, but you came back too soon. Can you go back another couple days and come back again? You'll find me just full bolt, full speed ahead. Participating in my vocation. He wants to reward you. You think he's rewarding any saltless individuals that become strengthless and useless? Too many of you find and create all kinds of different things to do in the Christian world, including carrying crosses across the country, to make up ways how you think you're saving yourself because you're doing what Christ wants you to do. He spoke in my heart. Or he spoke and I heard in my mind. In these days, he need only speak through his word. Tell me where. Tell me where he's going to speak to you in any other way. In his word. The Holy Spirit just confirms that. The Holy Spirit is not making up new gospel or an additional word that somehow got slipped by and not recorded. Tell me. Give me the chapters and verses. I challenge you. And you better know what you're talking about. Not memorize garbage that's been perpetuated throughout the decades of this is what this means. You better know why it means that. 
I'm not interested in making professing disciples. Christ is looking for disciples with the desire after he did what he did to follow him. Including, it's probably going to cost you, you something. And that something is forgetting your self-interest that gets in the way of taking up and carrying what has been raised up from that stake. And what is that? Christ. That's what the gospel message is all about. And the challenge is still there. Will you follow him the way he commanded? Or are you going to use some silly inter interpretation of what take up the cross means there? In his likeness is, he was the gospel. Now he's asking you to participate in getting the gospel to a lost starving world lacking the truth or never even hearing it rightly divided. I will not have on my watch what God's given me responsible for spiritual fools make God's word a mockery And to look foolish. Listen. It might still look foolish. Even as after rightly divided. But if they choose. To still think it's a foolish. Book. From Genesis to Revelation. They're going to choose that. After it's been rightly divided to them. Not because all those tricks and gimmick, gimmickry or <clears throat> gimmicks that are used to try to get your attention. There's tens of thousands of people that log onto this site. Very few becomes disciples of Jesus Christ the way the disciple has commanded them. And they move on. Hopefully they can find somewhere else to be a true disciple. And we use no gimmicks. All we tell people is where you can find the rightly, divor the rightly divided word of God. Well, what does that have to do with the mark of the beast? I can't fully explain the mark of the beast without laying down the foundation of the cross. Without laying the foundation of the cross. The starus. An outstanding factor that contributed to the adoration of the cross image within the Romish church was the famous vision of the cross and subsequent conversion of Constantine. As he and his soldiers approach Rome, they're about to face what is known as the Battle of Milvian Bridge. And that's where I'll pick it up next time. If you're interested for me to continue with this, I want to hear from you. I want to hear that you understand what the command is, not what silly doctrines has produced the made-up understanding of what this scripture is really saying. If you get it, I want to hear from you now. Play this song.